the Hope Community Church. It's a beautiful day. You could be out doing things like, you know, cutting the grass or pulling weeds, but you decided to be here, and we appreciate your presence with us. Um, over the summer here at Hope, we're doing a series of messages, um, and we're talking about Jesus over the summer. I know it sounds crazy to be talking about Jesus in church, but we're crazy enough to do it. And so what we're trying to do here over the summer is take a look at the life of Jesus, the chronological life of Jesus, and look at some of the highlights, look at his highlight reel, look at some of his greatest hits, uh, some of his major teachings, and some of the big events that he went through to learn a little bit more about the Jesus of Scripture. And so that's what we're doing here at Hope. And so we spent a few weeks already talking about Jesus, and we've had him introduced to us by John in the book of um, the Gospel of John. And we went from there, and we saw Jesus baptized. And, and so we're moving on, and uh, we're going to share another event that takes place in the life of Jesus and how he interacts with some people. I don't know if you're aware of this, but this is a, it's a big time of year for us at Hope and for my family personally. A lot of anniversaries going on. Um, as of this month, did you know that Hope Community Church is three years old? We are three years old. How about that? As of this month. It's a pretty big deal. Also, tomorrow is a big day. Tomorrow is June 15th, and I'm sure you all know that tomorrow marks the, the 10th anniversary of the movie Batman Begins, right? No applause for that? Okay, one person, that's fine. And coincidentally enough, there we go, coincidentally enough, it happens to be my anniversary tomorrow, too. <laughs> that's how I remember it, right? So eight years, come on, we can applaud for that. Holly's downstairs. She can hear you. And this past Monday was our, our youngest daughter, Evangeline, it was her birthday. So she's two, she's younger than this church. So she's two years old, and that's official. She's been acting like a two-year-old for some time now, if you know what I mean. Uh, but she's officially two as of this past, uh, this past Monday. Um, in the weeks leading up to Evangeline's birthday, Holly and I made a decision that it was time to get rid of her pacifier. She was very, very dependent on that binky, on her binkerton. And uh, we're like, okay, we got to break this habit at some point. You know, it's been useful to us, but we got it. We got to do this thing. And so we kept putting it off. You know, and that thing's like, okay, well, maybe we'll, we sat down with the calendar trying to find the best time to do this. We got to find a week where not too much is going on because we know it's going to be a transition. You take away that pacifier, you're going to have some, you know, difficulty getting her to take her naps and go to sleep and all that. And it's going to upset the whole household. And so we finally, it's like, okay, we just got to do this thing. So we picked a date. We stuck to it. We got rid of the pacifier. And it was a transition. It was difficult for her to let go of that thing that she had. I mean, she had done it her whole life. She was used to it. She found comfort in it. But we had, I mean, we had to, right? I feel bad even saying that. You took something away from Yeah, we had to take it away from her. It was us. We took it. We were so mean. We took away her pacifier. No, we had to. I mean, what were we supposed to do? Just let her keep it, you know, okay, another week, another month, another year, and then she goes to kindergarten with her pacifier, and then to college with her pacifier, and walking down the aisle with a pacifier. I mean, at some point, she had to let it go, and we had to help her with that, had to let it go. Now, all of us, there are things in life that, that as we mature, as we grow up, there are things that we need to let go of, and I'm not just talking about pacifiers and your, you know, your security blanket and your teddy bear. There are other things that we need to let go of in order to mature in order to grow up, in order to take that next step forward in life. Certain behaviors we need to stop, certain habits we've picked up that we need to let go of, certain attitudes that we have as kids or as adolescents that just won't work for us in adult life. You know, when I was a teenager, I had that classic teenage angst. That's not going to serve you very well as an adult. Some of you were angst-filled teenagers too. I knew you, some of you back then. And you let that go. You had to let that go in order to mature and take that next step in, in that next step in maturity, next, that next step in life, that next step in being an adult. There are certain things that we have to let go of in order to grow. Certain things we need to let go of in order to, to grow. Some of us say we had you know, certain things you want to be when you grow up. You go through the list of things, and when you're a kid, you just kind of rattle off some stuff you want to be when you grow up. Have you, you guys do that? You had certain you know, goals, you wanted to be certain things or do certain things as a kid, and they kind of change as you grow. At one point, I wanted to be a door-to-door -door encyclopedia salesman, but I had to let go of that dream. That's not even a thing anymore, right? Can you imagine somebody showing up to your door, hey, I'm selling encyclopedias. What? What's going on? Are you from the past? That'd be so crazy. That's not even a thing anymore, so I had to let go of that. At one point in my life, I wanted to be a comedian, but guess what I realized? I'm not that funny. <laughs> so I had to let go of that. You're all polite and you laugh at my jokes here, but I just, you know, I had, so I had to let go of that dream. At one point in my life, I wanted to be Batman. Okay, that's a bad example because I haven't let go of that one yet. But there are certain things that we need to let go of if you're going to take that next step forward. We need to let go. You know, you go through college and you have a great time and you're away from home and you're partying and you've got friends and you're all right there and you're part of this close-knit community and you're out every night and then you get a job and it's like, whoa, I can't go out every night anymore. If I keep doing this, 
This is not going to work out well for my career, for my professional life. And you let go of that. Some people don't realize that until a few years into their career, and it's like, okay, no, we have to let go of certain behaviors, certain attitudes, certain habits, certain way of thinking. We need to let go of things if we're going to grow and move forward. This morning you heard uh, Holly read a scripture passage where uh, Jesus is interacting with some people, and I'd like you to take a look at that passage now because we're going to meet some people who were challenged by Jesus to let go of some things in order to grow, in order to take that next step in their lives. Now this is, a, you know, an interesting passage of scripture, it certainly is, and there's a lot going on, and, and um, what happens here is, if you don't know the background, if you don't know the history, if you don't know a thing or two about the culture, there are things that we can miss about the significance of what's happening here in this scene. And so I need to give you a little bit of background about the history of the time and what was going on and why this was so significant and why this was, was such a challenging thing that, that Jesus asked these people to do. Um, back in Jesus' day, I mean, Jesus was a rabbi, a traveling teacher, and that was a thing. Not quite a profession because you lived off the charity of others, but it was a thing. And rabbis were well-respected men and, and um, they were thought well of and, and, and they had this whole kind of people who would, who would follow them and go after them and try to learn from them. And rabbis would teach people about God. And every rabbi had their own specific, uh, you know, teachings, understanding of the Scripture. They called it their yoke, uh, the thing that they understood, their specific teachings about the Scripture. And so Jesus was a rabbi, and he lived during the time of the rabbis. And so um, if you were, were growing up, you know, in this, in this time period, if you were, you know, a young man, you would have gone to some schooling as a kid, okay, some kind of like almost the equivalent of an elementary school type thing. And you'd learn your basics. You'd learn your math. You'd learn your language. But you'd learn it all through the Scripture, through what we now call the Old Testament. And so that was, that was key, and they were taught some things. And then some students would go on from there to the next level of schooling. Not everybody. You know, the girls would go back home then, and a lot of the boys would go back home then. But some would continue on to the next level of schooling. And that's where they really studied the Scriptures more, and they had to memorize the first five books of the Bible Okay, anybody here have that done? No? First five books of the scripture they had to have memorized. You, you, I see a hand raised here, right? Um, do you really? Do you have the first? Yeah. Okay, and so that was the thing they had to do if they were going to move on. And so after you were done that second level of schooling, if you actually made it through, that was impressive. But when you were done that, you went back home. You went back home, and if you were a guy, you would have learned your family trade. If your dad was a carpenter, you would become a carpenter. If your dad was a fisherman, you would be, there was some kind of trade that you had in your family. And so after that second level of schooling, you go back home, except for a select few. A select few who were ambitious enough to really, really dig into the Word of God. A select few who wanted to become rabbis who wanted to become these traveling teachers. They didn't have like a college type thing back then, but if you wanted to take your education to the next level, you would want to go study under a rabbi. And so you'd be about 15 years old if you were a guy, and you go and you say, okay, I've made it through the first level of school, made it through the second level of school, and I want to keep on learning about God. I want, to, I want to really dig into this thing. And so if that was you, you would go find a rabbi. This was kind of like your college search, and you look for the right school, and what's right for me, and is it close enough to home, and this, that, and the other. You would go out and seek a rabbi and learn something about him. Now, if you're going to seek a rabbi, there are certain things that you're really looking for because this is not the rabbi-disciple relationship. It's different from the teacher-student relationship. Like if you're a student and you're trying to learn from a teacher, you just want to learn what the teacher knows. If you're a disciple, you want to become like the rabbi. And so these young men, these 15-year-old guys, they're out looking for, for rabbis, for people that they thought, I can be like that guy. Hey, look at that guy over there. I want to be like him. I want to not only know what he knows, but I aspire to be some, someone like him. Do you know what that's like as a young person? Do you look up to older people and say, I want to be like that. That's the kind of father I want to be. That's the kind of you know, a husband I want to be. Do you do that? Look to certain people? Well, this is what, the, what these young men would do. And if, again, they had to be the best of the best and make it through those two levels of school. And so they would go up to rabbis and basically apply. Say, hey, I'd like to become one of your disciples. And so there'd be this trial period, okay? And during this trial period, that, that, that disciple would follow around the rabbi, that disciple in training or that disciple wannabe would follow around the rabbi and went, he would go wherever the rabbi went and, and do the things that the rabbi did. And after a period of time, the rabbi would either say, okay, you got what it takes, you can be my disciple. Or the rabbi would say, hey, you're a great, you're a great guy, you know the scripture well, go on home and learn your family trade now. And that was the polite rejection, and so that was the culture, that was the world that Jesus was born into, that's how the rabbinical system worked. And so here comes Jesus, the rabbi, 
And in this passage of Scripture, we hear about this strange event that happens, and, and there's a crowd of people that are following Jesus, and they want to hear what Jesus has to say, and it seems like this is what's happening. They're kind of closing in on him, and they're all on the same level, and Jesus is like, okay, I can't really teach people where there's a crowd forming. I need to get out somewhere where I can have some distance so everybody can hear me. And so he sees this guy, Simon, who's a fisherman. Simon worked with his brother, Andrew, and they had a couple partners. Um, James and John were another set of brothers that they worked with. And so Simon's there, and he's just gotten back from a night of fishing. Fishermen would fish at night. This wasn't sport fishing. This wasn't for a hobby. This wasn't for fun. This was his profession. So he was fishing all night, caught nothing. There he is. They're mending the nets. I mean, that's, that's got to be a pretty lousy feeling if you're out all night and you've got nothing to show for it. And so there he is. He's by the sea, and Jesus comes up to him and says, Hey, you, could you do me a favor? Let me hop in your boat, take me out a little ways from the shore so I can create some distance between myself and this crowd so I can teach everybody. And for some reason, Simon doesn't say, are you kidding me? Get away from me. <laughs> I don't know you. For some reason, Simon says, okay, Jesus, hi, I'm, I'm Simon, nice to meet you. So they get in the boat together, and Simon takes the boat out, and they get a little distance from the shore. And I wonder what, see, we're not told what Jesus said. We're just told that he taught the people all these things, and there's, you know, there's Simon, and he's just sitting there like in the boat. Everybody is facing forward and you're just kind of awkwardly there as Jesus is teaching. And so he had this awkward front row seat, this you know, first row seat for what Jesus had to say and, and he listens to what Jesus says and then the time of teaching was over and so Simon's like, wow, this guy, he really, he, you know, he's impressed in some way by what Jesus had to say. And so they bring the boat back up on the shore and there they are. And Jesus says, now I want you to, I want you to take the boat out. We're going to go fishing. Now, now it was daytime, okay? This is not when fishermen went fishing. It didn't work that way, and Simon knew it. And so Simon says to Jesus, look, Lord. First of all, he calls him Lord. So something happens here where, where Simon feels compelled to call him Lord. He said, listen, Lord, Rabbi, you're obviously a great guy. Listen, we, we went fishing all night. We didn't catch anything. But because you've said so, but because you've asked me to, Jesus, I'm going to do it. I wouldn't normally do this kind of thing, Jesus, because it doesn't make sense. This is not when people go fishing. But because you've commanded me to, I'm going to do it. And so they go out, they take the boats out. And if you heard Holly read the scripture passage, you know what happens. They catch so many fish that the boat is about to sink. And Simon's calling, James, John, get out of here. Bring your boat so they can lift the net. They couldn't even bring the net into the boat. They had to drag it up to the shore. And so when Simon sees this thing unfold, he's like, wow, I am right here face to face with, with somebody who has the power of God, maybe a prophet, maybe even the Messiah. This is a holy man of some kind. And he's scared. We know he's scared because Jesus says, don't be afraid. He's terrified. He says, look, you need to just leave because I'm not worthy to be in your presence. Go away from me, Lord. No, you need to, you need to like whatever I am and whatever you are, we're very different. I'm just a normal guy. I'm just a regular old sinner. And you're amazing. You need to leave. But Jesus, he makes this invitation. He makes this invitation to Simon. And he says, follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Now in that, you know, this invitation was huge because we don't know Simon's backstory. We don't know how far he got in school. We don't know if he had been rejected by other rabbis. We don't know that. But we do know that all of a sudden, here is this rabbi who's not just any old rabbi, an amazing prophetic teacher. And here he is saying, no, I want you, you Simon, you the fisherman, you who went back and learned your family trade, I want you to become one of my disciples. Follow me. Don't be afraid. Follow me. And what? And I will make you a fisher of people, a fisher of men. I'm going to teach you how to catch people. And Simon's response, he leaves everything behind and he follows this man, Jesus. At the time, he didn't know this was the Messiah, this was the Savior. He, he was probably hoping. I mean, the people there, they were hoping for a Savior. They were hoping for some kind of hero, some kind of Messiah. And, and they'd had these Old Testament prophecies. There'd be somebody coming into the world that was going to save them. And so he was probably hoping, well, this, I mean, he's clearly a man of God. Hopefully he's the Messiah. I'm going to follow him. He didn't know this was the Son of God. Not yet. But there was enough that happened in their encounter that compelled Simon to do this big thing of, of following Jesus. Matthew writes about the same event and tells us that, that when Jesus commanded Simon, and not just Simon, but Simon's brother Andrew and then their partners, James and John, when, when Jesus offered this invitation, they left everything behind 
and followed him. They left their nets. In fact, the word is immediately. Immediately. They dropped it all right there and followed Jesus. They dropped their nets. So I want to show you. I've got something here. I've got a net, okay? This is my net. And uh, these are not fish in this net. These are water balloons. These water balloons are not filled with water. They are filled with air. I thought water would be cool, but Holly talked me out of it. And so you will not be hit with a water balloon on your way out, thanks to Holly. Um, so not fish, but, but balloons here, okay? But they had these huge nets that were filled with fish, okay? And like I said, this was their profession. This wasn't for sport. This wasn't for fun. They were professional fishermen. So what were fish? What were fish to the fishermen? Money. Money. And they were looking at a big old payday. This wasn't like, yeah, hey, yeah, we had a nice haul. No, they had a tremendous haul. Remember what it says? They had to drag. They couldn't even lift it onto the boat. They had to drag it to the shore. All of that they had. All this money, this huge payday. And Simon walked away from it, left it right there immediately, and said, however good this is going to be, however much cash this is going to amount to, what he's offering, it's going to be better. I don't know where this guy is going to lead me. I don't know where we're going tomorrow. I don't know where we're going later today afternoon, but I'm going to follow him. He walked away from the fish. He walked away from the payday, but it wasn't just that. He was walking away from his livelihood. I mean, you're no longer, hey, Simon the fisherman, guess what? You're no longer a fisherman. You're going to be my disciple. I mean, guys, and this is probably true for women. I'm not trying to talk just to guys here. I feel like I've talked to guys a lot, and so forgive me for that. But guys, you know, sometimes your profession, don't you get your identity wound up in that? I mean, even when you meet new people, you introduce yourself usually by your profession or something like that. It's like, that's, that's so much of who you are gets tied to what you do. And so he was leaving his money. He was leaving this payday. He was leaving his profession. He was leaving a part of his identity behind so he could follow Jesus, a man that he'd really just met and wasn't entirely sure about. That's what he did. That was a, a huge step of faith and a huge step of trust. And this was a young guy. We don't know exactly how old Simon was. He was probably the oldest of the disciples. We know that because later on in the Gospels, we read about an account where Jesus and the disciples were at the temple and only, only the adults had to pay the temple tax and only Jesus and Simon had to pay that temple tax. So the rest of the disciples were younger. I mean, they were probably about 15, 16 years old. Did you realize that? That's how old the disciples were. Isn't that crazy? I mean, most of us in this room, if not all of us, are older than that. They were young guys, and so Simon was probably in his early 20s, between 21 and near 20 or 24, something like that. And he had a wife. We think they didn't have any kids, but he had a wife. We're told that he had a wife, and it's like, you know, the two of them, they had plans for their lives together, right? You know, Simon, he'd taken up his family trade. He'd become a fisherman. He was married, and, and we're told that, you know, they had this life together, and, and they probably didn't have kids yet. And so they were planning. This is what young couples do, right? Think, but okay, yeah, we're finally married, and one day we'll have like six kids, and, and they'll learn the family trade, and we're going to have an awesome family, and we'll be able to, to get our own place one day. And so they had these plans for their lives. And in that moment, Simon says, okay, plans, see ya, new plan. What's the new plan? Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? I'm not sure, but I'm going to follow this guy there. He let go of everything to follow Jesus. Now, how would you respond in that moment? I think it'd be like, well, listen, this is, I mean, clearly, you know, clearly you're a man of God, Jesus. Thank you for this invitation. Why don't you come on back like a week from now? I've got to talk to my wife about this, and we've got to consider our options and kind of take a look at our financial situation here, and then maybe, maybe I can kind of follow you part-time to start, and we can see what this is like and, you know, do a trial. No, that's not what Simon did. He just jumped into this thing. I mean, some people might, I mean, by our standards, it's kind of reckless, don't you think? But whatever Jesus had to offer was better than what Simon had for himself, had planned for himself, and had planned for his family. And so he does this thing, and he takes his brother Andrew, and they take James and John, and they all become followers of Jesus. Now, they could have said to Jesus, listen, yeah, we want to become your followers, but can we, can we take the fish with us? I mean, can we bring along this stuff? Can I just drag my net along with me because we got a big payday here, and maybe if we're hungry later, and let, let me just take all my stuff with me, and I'll follow you. Let me take the fish with me. Let me take my identity. I'll still be a fisherman. And let me take, you know, my, my family plans. Let me take, you know, all my whole life right now, I'm going to bring it along with me. And all my, all my, all my baggage, I'm going to bring along with me into this new relationship, into this new thing. And my old identity, I'm going to bring that with me too. But he didn't do that. I mean, he was really leaving so much behind to follow Jesus. 
My question for you is this. If, if you spent any time in church as a kid, like I did, is this how Christianity was presented to you? That if you're going to become a Christian, if you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to take whatever's in your net and leave it behind and follow Jesus. Is that how Christianity was presented to you? Because it wasn't presented that way to me. It really wasn't. And so many of us Christians, you know, people who call ourselves Christians, we think, well, you know what we can do? I'm just going to, my whole life and my plans and my, you know, net full of fish, whatever your fish are, you know, my baggage and my history and my, and my old attitudes and my old behaviors and my, you know, my, my judgmentalness and all that, I'm going to bring that right along with me into following Jesus. All my stuff is coming with me. Everything that I was and every, all my plans, I'm not changing anything. I'm not giving up anything. I'm just going to add. In fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to add Jesus to my net. And keep on carrying that with me through life. That's not what Jesus calls us to do. He says, whoa, 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 whoa. If you want to be my follower, let that stuff go. Let that stuff go so you can follow me. I don't, I don't know what your fish are. I don't know what your air-filled water balloons are in your life. But Jesus, when he calls us to follow me, he's saying you've got to let go of something before you can take that next step and follow me. You have to let go of something now, for some people, it's, you know, that we talk about sin. Nobody wants to talk about sin. I don't want to talk about sin, even in church. But we talk about sin. You know, there are, th- there are certain things we do that just aren't good for us. You know, God has told us not to do certain things, not to act a certain way, not to behave a certain way. And he's told us this because he loves us. He's what's best for us. And so some people, they've got some sins in their net. They say, okay, I want to I wanna follow you, Jesus. I, you know, I want to be saved by you, but I'm going to hang on to my sins because I just can't, you know, my addictions or whatever it is, I can't let them go. I'm just going to drag them with me into this relationship with you, Jesus. Jesus says, no, you don't want that burden. You've got to let go of that before you can follow me. You know, one of the things that we set out to be here at Hope Community Church, I mean, what we want to do here is we want to be a church for people who aren't Christians yet. A place where people can learn, a place where people can come and, you know, and, and be whatever they are. Bring that with them into this space and then leave it behind eventually. That's what it is. And one of the reasons that, like, and that's, that's a really overwhelming thing, you know, over three years ago when we were planning this church thing and thinking about, wow, if we're like, if we're trying to be a church that's really for people who aren't Christians yet, like, who's going to do all the stuff? Who's going to lead? I mean, we need some Christians, don't we, to be leaders and to help run the stuff and to do the programs? Don't we need some Christians? And yes, we do. And so it's like, f- thankfully, God has given us some, uh, some Christians. But there is this little thing about me that's kind of excited about the prospect, the possibility of working with a bunch of people who aren't Christians, because Christians carry around some, some nets, <laughs> you know. And so those of you who are Christian, you know, if you grew up in a Christian household, it doesn't matter if you're a Protestant, Catholic, or whatever you called yourself or whatever it is. I mean, a lot of us who grow up as Christians, we get a net full of things too that we bring into our relationship with Jesus. Certain things that we think are okay, you know, you grow up and you think, well, this is what it means to be a Christian. It means, you know, you got to go to church, you got to go to Bible study, you got to study your Bible, you got to, you know, do devotions once a day, you got to do good deeds, and, and you got to like certain music, and you can't watch certain TV shows, and that's what it means to be a Christian. And so we put that into our net, our own individual idea of what it, idea of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We put that into our net, and then we meet Jesus face to face, and he says, no, 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 that's not what I want from you. No, 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 following me is something greater than that. We said, well, wait on, I came from a Christian home and I know Christian stuff, so this is, like, I already got the Christian thing figured out, Jesus. You don't need to tell me what it means to be a Christian. My parents taught me. I heard from some pastor, some Sunday school teacher. He's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. What if you heard wrong? What if you heard wrong? I mean, a lot of us who call ourselves Christians, we're carrying around these nets, and we gotta let stuff go if we're actually going to follow Jesus. Our old attitudes our old understanding of what it means to be a Christian, we got to let that go. In fact, for a lot of us who are, you know, grew up as Christians, what we need to do to actually become followers of Jesus is we need to let go of our Christianity. We need to let go of our Christianity to follow Jesus. We need to let go of our religion to actually follow Jesus and do the things he actually said to do. And when I say we need to let go of our Christianity, I mean we need to let go of our specific version of Christianity that we've pieced together because it's flawed. If you grew up like I did as a church kid, you got a lot of information thrown at you about what it means to be a Christian. Hey, not all that information was correct. It just wasn't. It can't be. I mean, there's going to be some things in there that we picked up along the way that are probably, wait a minute, wait a minute, where did I come up with this? See, the way we get to know Jesus and what he really has for us and what he really has commanded us to do and what it really means to follow him is through the Bible. 
And so there are a lot of churches out there, there are a lot of people out there, a lot of religious people out there, pastors, preachers, whatever, who try to teach people this book, and that's fantastic. But then they sort of go off script and say, well, this is what it means to be a Christian, or that is what it means to be a Christian. And we come up with these ideas that are just, just wrong, and then if we actually meet Jesus face to face and look in, meet him in his word, and we learn what it actually means to be a father, I say, wait a minute, wait a minute, this was, this was different than I understood and so I really want to talk to those of you who are brought up in a Christian household, and I'm going to challenge you to think about this. I mean, you may, you may be carrying some stuff with you into your relationship with Jesus. Jesus doesn't want you to hang on to it. I mean, I spend a lot of time with Christians. I guess, I guess that's the nature of being a pastor, right? You spend a lot of time with Christian people, and I hear some crazy, crazy stuff. You know, crazy ideas that Christians have about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to follow Jesus, and I'm like, I don't think your God and my God are the same God. <laughs> So I don't think we're on the same page here. And so the thing is, with Hope Community Church, what we wanted to be is we wanted to be a church that's about what God wants, what God wants. Not what we want, not what we think church is supposed to be, not what we would like church to be, but what we believe God wants and what God wants church to be and what God needs church to be. When we go to the Bible looking for religion, you'll probably find it. If you go to the Bible seeking after a, a, a moral way to live your life, you'll probably find it. If you go to this book seeking after the question, seeking an answer to the question, God, what do you want? You'll find that too. And as a church, we at Hope Community, we are about trying to, to do what God wants us to do in this community. We don't go to this book seeking for religion. We don't go to this book seeking for, for morality. We go here seeking after God. God, what do you want us to do? God, what do you want more than anything else? God, what are you passionate about? When you bring that question to this book, you find an answer. It's one answer that we find articulated in so many different ways all throughout both the Old Testament and, this, and the New. This book is one story about one God on one mission questing after one thing. And you know what that one thing is? It's people. It's us. God is the Father of us all and he loves us and he wants to have a relationship with us that lasts forever it's right there in today's scripture passage what does jesus call simon to become what is call what does he call simon to do what does he say follow me simon and i'm gonna make you more religious follow me simon and i'm gonna make you more ethical Follow me, Simon, and I'm going to make you richer. Follow me, Simon, and I'm going to make you a Christian. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say any of that. Follow me. You know about fishing, right, Simon? You're going to become a fisher of people because that's what I want, people, because that's what I'm all about. That's what Jesus was all about, and he continues to be. He wants us. He wants people. And like I said, he wants a relationship with us that lasts forever. That's why God sent Jesus into the world so Jesus could pay this, you know, the, the penalty for our own sinfulness so that everyone who puts their trust in Jesus can have an eternal relationship with Father God in heaven. That's what God is all about. I'm telling you, challenge you. Read this book with that question in mind. God, what do you want? And that's what you see. God wants us. He wants to save us. We need to let go. I mean, listen, we're only three years old, but we've already come up with some ideas and we start to get sidetracked and we start to think, okay, this is what church is supposed to be about. This is what Christianity is supposed to be about. We gotta do certain programs. We can't say certain cuss words. We can't watch certain movies. We gotta let go of all that. It's okay, God, you tell us what it's supposed to be about. And God says back to us, it's about people. The reason we do this thing on Sunday mornings, you know, worship service, church service, whatever you wanna call it, is to give people an opportunity to meet Jesus. To give people an opportunity to find out what he's really about. To experience his love in some, in some way, in some finite, limited way. I mean, that's what we're about here. We want people to experience Jesus. And so if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, if you're going to be a disciple, if you want to call yourself that, wow, that's a big term, disciple, whew. If you want to call yourself that or think of yourself that way, or if you want to be a part of Hope Community Church, what you need to be about is sharing Jesus, the hope that is found in Jesus with other people. How do you do that? How do you share Jesus with other people? I mean, Jesus, he's offering good things. He's offering salvation. He's offering forgiveness. He's offering eternal life. How do you share that with other people in this culture? 
Well, hey there, friend. I was wondering, um, could I talk to you about the Lord? No, you cannot. <laughs> I'm going to pass on that. I mean, that, you know, I'd like to talk to you about Jesus. Oh, boy. Really? I mean, you could try that approach. I'm not saying that doesn't work. I'm, you know, I'm just saying, you know, you think about your own friends, your own family members, your, co- your coworkers, and if you approach them that way, how would they respond? We'd like to talk to you about the Lord. Oh, please go ahead. This is going to be great. This is going to be fun. You know the comedian Jim Gaffigan? You know that guy? Hot pockets. Anybody know that guy? He tells this joke about the Pope, and if you're Catholic, don't be offended by this, but he says, like, you could go up to the Pope and say, I'd like to talk to you about Jesus. He'd be like, all right, not so, not so much, freak. No, thank you. I leave work at work. I mean, it just doesn't come up that way. So, I, you know, Jim Gaffigan, look him up. He's on Netflix. He's funny. It doesn't work that way. I mean, it really doesn't. Maybe it, it, sometimes it does, okay? Don't get me wrong. If you've had that approach with people, and if it's worked, who am I to criticize what's worked? But you know the people in your life. I'm not talking about some hypothetical people that you're going to go and evangelize to. I'm talking about the people you know right now. If you went up to them and said, yo, I want to talk to you about Jesus right now, and I believe you're a sinner. Do you believe you're a sinner? Let's talk about heaven. Probably wouldn't go great. I mean, I know within my circle of friends and family members, that kind of thing wouldn't go over too well. So how do you do it? If you're supposed to be a fisher of people, if that's your deal, if you're a follower of Jesus and that's what he wants you to be, how do you actually do that? You know one way. You can invite them to join you for church service on Sunday morning. You don't have to say, I'd like to talk to you about the Lord. You say, hey, what are you doing Sunday morning? What are you doing Sunday morning? You want to come to church with me? Well, no, I see, I, I, no, 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 I don't know about going to church because it's like I'm not really a religious person. Oh, that's okay. You don't have to be a religious person. That's fine. You can come anyway. Well, the thing is, I'm, I, you know, I, I don't want to go to church with you. Thank you. Big, you know, I'm, just, I'm not a Christian. That's okay. You don't have to be a Christian. Come anyway. Just come and check it out. You don't need to be a Christian. You don't need to be a religious to come here. Just come check it out. Anyway. Well, I, uh, I don't know. I don't, I'm not even sure if I believe in God or not. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. You don't have to believe in God. You know how that, that stuff's sorted out already. No, just come. Just come and see. Just come check it out. I mean, if you hate it, you hate it, whatever. And I'll take you out to lunch afterwards, whatever. It is. I mean, that's, it can be that simple. I call it simple because it's, it's, it's easier than trying to open up the Bible and read it to somebody else, right? But it's that invitation. Come and see. Come and hear. I mean, listen to some songs about what God is like. Listen to some scripture about what God is like. Hear some kind of sermon or message about what God is like and see if that makes some kind of impact on you. Now, the other thing I want you to notice about Jesus' invitation here is like, all right, Here's what I want from you, Simon. You become a fisher of people, and then I'll come back for you. You experience some kind of change. You get your life in order. You give up all your stuff, and then I'll come back for you. Jesus doesn't say that. He says, I am going to make you. I'm going to transform you into a fisher of people. If you're carrying around a net, okay, if you brought some preconceived notions about Christianity into your relationship with Jesus or whatever it is, don't feel guilty about it. Just start unloading it, okay? One piece at a time. One piece at a time. Get rid of that stuff that's getting in your way of your building a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes we, we hear these big stories about how camp communities are transformed and how you know, people go from poverty to, to, to wealth and you know, these big transformations that can happen. You know what? In order to make a big change in our community, I don't think there needs to be one huge big event but a lot of small ones, a lot of small events. Doing something simple like inviting somebody to church with you, that can have a lasting impact. This is how we are changing our community, just by introducing people to Jesus. You can do that. If you want to, if you're willing to accept the call, you can change people's lives. You can play a part in exposing people to Jesus and what he's about and his love and his salvation. You can do that. But you have to be willing to let some things go. You have to be willing to become a fisher of people. Are you ready for that? Give me some kind of nod. Are you ready to become fishers of people? Are you ready to be about the thing that God has called us to be? Then let's go fishing.